we want to um, embrace the opportunity that we have now and for the, the webinars that are going to be coming in the next few uh, months um, to, to create a space where we, we have content, uh, knowledge, if you like, uh, more of a classroom feel, perhaps, uh, an opportunity to wrestle with some of the, the big ideas and the big uh, challenges that are in our culture, in our organisations, in the structures, uh, and that we face in our local communities uh, with regards to this question. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing now, actually. We're, we're going to have a time of uh, uh, allow, b giving the platform to Arno Steen Andreasen, Dr. Reverend Arno Steen Andreasen. Um, uh, we're, we're, essentially, what we're doing is we're inviting someone who has perhaps gone a little bit further in their wrestling with some of these questions, someone who's perhaps uh, dug a little bit deeper. And we want this to be exposed to everybody. We don't think these questions are just for a few at the top, uh, uh, for a certain few. We think um, this, this is a conversation for everybody at every level, for the margins uh, and for those on the edge, as well as everybody in the center. So um, I'm gonna welcome Arno, and we're gonna have about 20 minutes of teaching from Arno. Our theme for the session is, where do we go from here? what is the state of uh, Christianity and uh, how can we move forward in a polarized time in history? Sounds interesting. I think it does. Uh, already now, before I invite Arno just to jump in, uh, we have the chat function, which is operational. So even if you've got questions before Arno's talked, don't be shy, you can write them in the chat. Uh, and as Arno's talking you can already be uh, typing in your questions we'll do our best to collect them and uh, we'll pose them to Arno a little bit later so here we go welcome Arno take it away thank you so much well uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, it's just really good to uh, to be here and to to share with you um let me just give you a little bit of who I am let me tell you but um well, I work for Salvation Army. I'm a civilian and I have worked for Salvation Army in Copenhagen for the last four years, where I work with uh, migrants, uh, especially the homeless. Um, but otherwise, I, um, as Mark mentioned, I am the co-president of the European Forum for LGBT Christian Groups, which is an umbrella organization for groups that are Orthodox, Catholic or Protestant um, in more than 20 different countries of Europe. And we want to kind of push the whole thing of how to see change in church and in society. Um, but also, I, I, I have been a pastor for more than 20 years. And when, one of the things we maybe can discuss a bit of the also the pain of losing your ministry. So when I came out five years ago, I lost my international ministry. I was um, the overseer of a small international movement of churches. Uh, of church plants and social action ministries. And within 48 hours, I lost everything. And maybe we can talk a bit about things like that. Um, I'm also a psychotherapist of background. And therefore, if you're interested in also looking at what effect does it have on people in our churches when we keep on talking about them being ab abomination or that they go to hell or conversion therapy where we're trying to pray the gay away, we can also talk about things like that. Um, I was married for 30 years to a woman um, until I divorced five years ago, and I have two adult children as well. So I've also lived through that whole change, and I've been through conversion therapy over many, many years. So uh, that's just kind of some of my background, and maybe we can kind of uh, look at what does it mean, what's the pastoral effects of the kind of of church that we are in Salvation Army and other places when we're not inclusive, because it actually has incredible impact on people's lives. Um, I've written three books. Uh, the latest one is Desiring God, Meditations for the Gay Man and Other Edgy People. And that is really part of my own healing project. I was um, trying to mirror my life uh, in different Bible texts, trying to find healing, trying to get over trauma, trying to cope with what I've heard and experienced through church. And um, I have 
put a couple of chapters into a PDF, but we were trying to upload it into the chat here, but it was not possible. So maybe we can send it to you via email or in another way if you're interested in just trying to see both the inclusive heart of God, but also uh, some of the healing part of God, because I did not get, I, I did not pray the gay away, even though I tried for many years, but I got healed from being straight acting. And uh, now I can be myself. See, I, I believe that we are in a time of we, a bit like stealing the title of uh, John of the Cross and John of the Cross, where he talked about the dark night of the soul, you know, those times of wrestling in our lives. But I actually do believe that we are in the dark night of the church because there's so many things that is just not really shifting in church life over these years. Uh, my experience is that I, I was a church planter in the UK for quite a few years. I'm from Denmark. I work with students also from Africa and Asia and was part of planting churches there as well. So this is kind of where I've got my, my, my understanding from. But it looked like that we've tried so many things through missions. We've tried to try, pl plant churches, have fluid churches, inclusive churches, fresh expression churches. We've had, uh, you know, taking the whole nation for Christ. And if you look at it over the last 30 years or so, church is still declining. So there's something about this whole thing where church is just not really connecting. But also we are in this losing battle, I feel, that where therefore we end up, uh, that we kind of go for tradition instead of renewal because we, we hold on to the tradition because we know what that means. And we are so afraid of losing our, our kind of a, our heart and who we are. And, but the problem is we're losing who we are because we hold on to tra 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 uh, tradition instead of the DNA of what, what are we all about. Or we see that the whole thing we're afraid of, of, of discussing also inclusion because all these immoral gays, you know, they, they, then everything will go. You know, and if, if we allow gay people to really live out their gay, gayness, if they are kind of practicing homosexuals, then your morals will go down in church. So it's the kind of the last thing that we're trying to hold on to because we lost the whole thing of divorce. We lost the whole thing of remarriage. We lost the whole thing of definitely uh, churches outside the Salvation Army that were against female leaders for many years. Now also you get women bishops and things in many denominations. So there's so many battles that are lost that is almost like the church is holding on to this last thing. LGBT, we are definitely not allowed to lose that one as well. So it looks to me as we've lost the pioneering, the risk taking, we've lost the whole thing of simplicity. We end up doing more and more performance. I don't know about your worship service, but I've been to a lot, both in Salvation Army and other churches. And sometimes it's more about almost impressing others of how smooth things can be or how nice it can be or having the right brass band or worship band instead of the simplicity of worshiping God and really connecting with God. And just the last point is just kind of a, if you're taking in the bigger scene of things that we, as churches, we often get, get so much into want to be good friends with, with people in power. Just look at the Trump situation in the States where, you know, majority of white evangelicals were supporting Trump. And we see these pictures on Facebook where they came into his, the Oval Office and they prayed for this man, but they sold their soul because many of the policies were as anti-Christ as could be. But we are so desperate that people recognize us, that we are happily selling off our souls to power. So who is truly empire and who is truly the kingdom of God? And one of my problems, for instance, is when I look at the mission statement of the Salvation Army, and I'm sure many of you have had that discussion, but as a civilian and therefore an insider but also an outsider when i read that last sentence i have huge huge issues meet human needs in the name without discrimination it means i when i read that i think that i am as an out gay person would be fully included and affirmed well i might be allowed to attend the night shelter 
as a trans person, I might be allowed to go to the to the drop in uh, the soup kitchen or something else. But actually, as a soldier, as an officer, I stand no chance. So when people also said to me when I came to Denmark and got employed in the Salvation Army, they said to me, oh, but why are you not an officer? And my answer was, I cannot promise you never to fall in love. I cannot make that promise. But if I fall in love, I will be a pastoral problem and you will throw me out. I've tried that once. I'm not going through that twice. And no matter how much I feel at home, I am not at home when I'm just tolerated. As one officer said to me, but of course, Arnold, you're welcome to come and worship here. Could you imagine saying that to all our female officers? Well, you're allowed to come and worship here, but you can't say anything. You can't do anything, you know, because you are a woman or me as a gay man. If I have a boyfriend or get married, then it is a total no-go. And more and more churches, evangelical, charismatic, Pentecostal churches, say they are including, but they are not. They might be welcoming as long as I come and just sit quietly and pay my 10% of my income. But do not kind of show off too much that you are gay. Do not come with your boyfriend. Do not do these other things because actually you're not truly included. You're just tolerated. If I said to my two children that I tolerate them, I don't think they'll come and visit me that much. They want to be loved, included, fully a part of the family, not pushed away in any way. So we have a lot of church spin going on for many churches at the moment. And it's very harmful for LGBT people because we are looking for places where it's safe to be and to tell our stories. If we just look at the bigger context, which is where I'm coming from and what I'm in presentation, this is from ILGA, where it looks at all the different nations of the world. And we often hear people saying, oh, stop flagging up all your sexuality, stop doing these things, you know, it is quite okay, what's your problem? I'd like to hear which other people group experienced this level of discrimination. In 43 countries in the world, there's no legal protection for people from the LGBT plus community. In 27 countries, you can get 10 years in prison for being LGBT. In six countries, you can face the death penalty. Tell me any other group that faces this kind of discrimination. So how come churches that it very much want to stand up for social justice do not see this as a problem? How come that this is not something that we must all be on the barricade saying, this is not right, that you are not allowed to be? For many years has been this almost cliche in English saying, I'm not a human doing, I'm a human being. But I'm not allowed to be in many of these countries. If I would go back to visit some of the ministries in India that I was involved in before, I could be in danger just for being me. So how come this is that we are not shouting about this? Or there was a big survey, I was part of a consultation, European Commission, where they looked at how to push forward the agenda of LGBT for the next seven years. And one of the things that was really difficult for me was to see that the European Commission was more committed to LGBT inclusion than the churches. I come from a background where I read the Bible, we see that the kingdom of God is up against the empire because the empire is the one that oppresses, the empire is the one that discriminates, the empire is the one that, that destroys people's lives. But when I went to this, this consultation with the European Commission, it was not the empire that was doing that, it was the church. That was really difficult for me. But also just look at here, just in one of the many charts that's in this fantastic report, it's talking about politicians speaking out against LGBT 
some of the nations it's 93 percent 91 percent you can see some of these countries how it is that lgbt people are being used as the scapegoat when you have to show what is to be a patriot it's not to be lgbt because that is a bad thing they are the pedophiles they are the ones that are destroying family life all these different things we can see here how it is the best country is the netherlands and denmark belgium as you can see here at the bottom of it so there are still big issues in society even the european union but still the commission said we want equality or look at what lgbt people are facing in our communities 67 percent was name calling was a very of harassment 68 percent ridiculing you know some years ago, I went to a big LGBT conference in the States. We were 1,400 people. And one night we had a Virgil where we were kind of just praying about people who have experienced violence or death because of being LGBT. For 20 minutes, people just shouted out names, one after the other, of people who've been beaten up or killed for being LGBT in the US. When I came back to say to the leadership team in the Danish territory, one of the officers said to me, that is all too tough, Arno. Why are you saying negative things like this? I'm saying it because it's the truth. It's our reality. Who wants to stand up for us? Then at this conference with the European Union, they kept on saying the common enemy, the common enemy. And I thought, who are they talking about? Who is this common enemy? Until I realized that what they were talking about, no matter if it's NGOs or politicians or the commission, the common enemy was the church, the populists, and the right-wing nationalists. How do you feel when you tonight hear that it was a common knowledge that the enemy of integration and inclusion was the church? And we are put just as much into the total far right extremists. That is the group that we belong to in their minds. Can, do you recognize that from your life? I was horrified when coming from the evangelical charismatic wing of the church to know that we are seen as the common enemy. But when I then see also some of these headlines and I follow some of these headlines every day, what is going on, Franklin Graham, you know, the, the son of Billy Graham. Again and again, we hear him talk about LGBT people being the enemies. You know, Christian children are not allowed to work with uh, Christian children of LGBT uh, parents because they are destroying their families, things like that. You cannot get hospital help or other help with, 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 with if you are LGBT. Things like this. When is the church going to speak truth to power? instead of falling in love with power. One of my friends, Carol Shepard, she's a leading expert uh, as a researcher about bisexuality, but she also wrote this book very recently. And um, she's trying to challenge us as a church the church at last, large, and she's asking us, do we tr have blood on our hands? Because it's much more dangerous to be LGBT and of Christian faith than LGBT of no faith. Some research shows that it's you're three times more likely to commit suicide if you're a Christian LGBT than if you're not. More people, if you look at it, some of the statistics from England and the States, talk about that homeless people, about 30 to 40% are LGBT. If you then think about that we are, we will always be a minority, two, three, four, five percent of the population, but 30, 40 percent of people suffering homelessness in some countries are LGBT, and many of them coming from Christian backgrounds. If, you, if the theology of the church puts people in the street, we have an issue. If the theology of the church, no matter how high view you have of the Bible, is part of destroying people's lives, there is an issue with our theology. Two illustrations from Poland. 
Again, to be a patriot in Poland, you cannot be LGBT. There are many, many local authorities that proclaim their LGBT free zones. So for instance, there was um, some people who have made the Madonna uh, Mary with a, a, a rainbow, as you can see at the top, and several people went to court and they could face up to two years in prison for hurting religious feelings. Just the other day, we heard that they didn't have to go to prison. But the gentleman at the bottom of, of the picture, he's also from Poland. He conducted a worship service, listen, a worship service at Pride. And because of that, he hurt religious feelings. And we still do not know if he will end up two years in prison for having a worship service. Shouldn't that make Salvation Army want to do worship services every single pride in Europe? Everywhere? You know, when I was trained in church planting, I always heard, and we were not Salvation Army, it was another group, we always heard Salvation Army will go and nobody else will go. So where is Salvation Army? Are they going all the different places? Do we dare to face the same as this man, possibly two years in prison for worshiping God? I think one of the problems in church is actually our Bible interpretation. I'll do this quick. I know my time is up. But often what I hear is that people just quote scripture at me. And they're very good at quoting that I'm an abomination. The problem is, if you don't understand what it means, it just means cultural, it means a cultural unacceptable. But people are sending me to hell with verses like that. And evangelical church is to stop just learning the bible by heart and actually start to find out what does it mean and Richard Raw has this beautiful thing of saying basic basic faith is just quoting the bible who is in and who is that black and white sinner saint but then we have the prophetic people the prophetic books that start to challenge the status quo speak truth to power and that's also good but we need to even get to wisdom where we dare to look at the paradoxes in the Bible, things that, that is difficult, verses that do not necessarily connect with each other. And I think before we get to that, we will not see inclusion in the church. And remember, we do not worship the Bible, we worship Jesus. And the Bible never says it's the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. I will not go into this one, but I just wanted to challenge you again, because the evangelical church would tell me that if I have sex with one man, I will go to hell. If I'm a practicing homosexual, I will go to hell. Because I'm an, I will then be an idol worshipper. And then I get challenged by people like Solomon. He's got three books in the Old Testament. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. And it says in 1 Corinthians... Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, neither the sexual immoral? But we read in 1 Kings that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. We read that he was an idol worshipper. Are we saying Solomon is not saved? If not, why are we reading three of his books in the Bible? So when we so easily throw gay people, LGBT people to, to hell, it's because we do not have a consistent interpretation of the Bible. Can you follow me? One of the big challenges we have, I'm almost done. And this is um, Patrick Dixon who talks about the whole thing of, of the megatrends of this world. In one way, we like the uh, universal thing. The army, everything's the army is the same in 130 countries in the world. McDonald's is the same in all the countries in the world. All this, we all want to speak English, all these different things. And therefore, again, of course, also like Salvation Army has an issue because we all, the, the decision about LGBT has to be the same all over the world. The problem is us who come from minority group, we need our tribe. We need a place to belong. But I do not belong to Salvation Army when I'm not fully included. And also because people nowadays want something fast, they want change now, it means that we are so behind as a church, we cannot keep on using years and years to discuss these things because then we have too many of us have left the church 
and others who do not want to be in such a, a, a discriminatory church. We need to see change now. Can I challenge you with this, just from two different books? What I experienced as a Christian and as a psychotherapist is that there's a, such a need for more authenticity. No more just image, no more just impressing others, just something very authentic. There's a book come out with full of pictures of men's love to each other for over a hundred years while it was uh, in these countries where the pictures are from was, was just, uh, was illegal. Or the other picture from the secret ward at the first HIV ward in England that nobody was allowed to know was there, where people were there together, loving each other, even they were dying. This love is what the church is telling me is wrong, that I cannot love, I can only lust. But we need a body that longs for authenticity and expression of true love. Can I just finish with this prayer? Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love me, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. May God bless our discussion. Amen. Well, thank you, Arno. Um, I don't know where to start. It was so much. Uh, all, good, all good stuff and so many of the, the topics that you covered, uh, I mean, they're sessions in and of themselves just to jump and, and drill down into. Uh, but we're going to have a little moment, an opportunity to maybe kind of dig a little bit deeper. Uh, we just encourage you, or you know, just to continue encouraging you to use the chat. And uh, someone on our panel is going to be feeding some of those questions to me. But just to kick us off, I know you dropped a bit of a bombshell. Uh, you, you said that. Um, what did you say? You said Jesus is the Word of God, not the Bible. Yes. Uh, what do you mean by that? Does that mean? Well, the Bible never states that it's the Word of God. It's the word of man. It is inspired by God, is breathed by God, but it is not God's word. And that is one of our problems, because if we see it as God's word, we easily become, become fundamentalists or literalists, and we just quote this verse at each other. And when we start to just quote verses at each other, we easily become Bible bashers, depending on which denomination we are from. And we try to win the battle of the Bible. But instead, we need to actually find out what is the heart of God? What is, is Jesus trying to tell us? Because think about it, Jesus is the face of God. And therefore, we need to, in whatever interpretation we come up with, we need to keep on saying, does this taste like Jesus? Does it feel like Jesus? Does it have the atmosphere of Jesus? If not, it is just not a God thing. And if you look at the Old Testament, there's so many misunderstandings and, and, and difficult things. And that's one of the reasons why Jesus had to come was to say, let's clear up this mess. You know, this is how to interpret it. This is how to do something. So what I'm just trying to say is that the Bible says that Jesus is the word of God. So let's try to get hold of the living word of God. That doesn't make interpretation easier, but it's much more fun and we will hurt fewer people. Oh, that's really good and it's, it's good if we yeah to keep our answers short because i've got the, the i can see the chat is just going going wild at the moment so we're gonna have a lot of questions um but yeah uh, that, that's that's really interesting i've got a lot of questions um particularly about i mean you, the title of your talk was where do we go from here and you gave us a snapshot of some of the the, the big challenges yes. that we face culturally structurally um, and, you know, this context for this conversation, I'm not saying that everybody's part of the Salvation Army here, but most of us will be. Um, my, my first question to you would be, like many of our institutions and structures, for a whole host of re reasons, have not been great hmm. at um, mobilising this conversation so it reaches the, the margin, so it reaches everybody. Um, just, just from your perspective, uh, 
what what sort of practices and behaviors um do we do we need to be adopting in this moment as we're not at the center a lot of us we're not many of us are not you know driving the challenge from the center to some of these structural things what would you say to us what what can we do uh, give us something well i think first of all you need to be much bolder yet because the problem is when we have a hierarchy that there's a number of denominations in the world that's very strongly hierarchical it means that you also are told what to believe and what to think and if you want a career within that movement, it's very difficult to speak up against people above you. And therefore also even people, also TCs that will be very inclusive, very often, well, I've not heard that many voices yet publicly say something. So we have an issue in people daring to speak out. So I think that we need to keep on challenging people in leadership to actually dare to say something but also, as you started saying, we need to hear stories because without the stories, we have an issue. But also, even for me as a civilian, I have a problem. I'm part of leading a human rights organization for LGBT, but I also have to be loyal to Salvation Army. So, for instance, there was a podcast being made about my life. And the first question was, you work for Salvation Army. They are not inclusive, are they? What shall I answer? Because if I answer true, truthfully, Salvation Army in Denmark could lose money because people will be horrified to find out that Salvation Army is not inclusive. So if I speak out, it could hurt our finances. At the same time, where, but nobody wants to listen to me to say, well, actually there's an issue here. So what do you do? So I went around it saying, well, I'm a civilian, so it's Danish law and therefore I don't have an issue. But that's actually not fair that I cannot even as a civilian really speak out and say there is a real issue here and people are getting hurt. So I think that that we need to say more stories. We need to put more pressure on it. Uh, I think we need, it's good that also many things take it on YouTube, some of those stuff. I think we need to, to keep on pushing the agenda also an open meeting saying, what are we going to do about this? Um, so I think there's an awful lot of pressure, but we just need to know that the world has moved on many places. You know, in Denmark, we've had civil partnership for 31 years, and the church has not started debate this yet. The movement is that things have to go fast. That's the mega trend. So do not think that we're going to discuss this for the next five years. It'll create so much pain if it's five years or whatever. So I think we need to put it on the agenda and start to demand up in the system that things are going to be discussed. I've got a question just off the back of that then, I know. Um, I was just reading a book recently by David Gushy, and uh, he talks about, often we, we talk about traditionalists versus revisionists, but he also yeah. talks about, um, I don't want to label anybody, that's not what we're here to do, but avoiders. Um, and he, he, he says that uh, often avoiders with different levels of intensity, um, they, they avoid talking about it um, often because their role is linked to, and their responsibility is linked to holding the institution together. And I know this sounds bad, but sometimes even they're holding their role, holding their job. Um, you know, what would you say to people who have perhaps got roles, they're, they're key leaders of influence, they, they have these conversations perhaps, and these views personally, mm. um, what would you say to people who perhaps would fit into that category? And I, I do apologise for labelling people, but what would you what would you say to them? The thing is that, I, I, of course, we need allies, but actually, I suffer much more than the allies. The allies might have a bit of issues with the career, but they're still not being thrown out of their uh, of 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 the church. I was thrown out of the church. Here, five years later, I'm still not in church leadership and ministry, even though it's my calling because no evangelical church dares to touch me because I'm an out gay man. So I lost everything for being a gay man. Even an ally do not lose that much. So what I will say is that actually, if you believe in something, you need to stand up for it. You know, and no liberation has happened without sacrifice. And no matter if we look at Black Lives Matter in the States, black and white people, were in danger. If you see the liberation of India, again, people's lives happen. You know, no women's voting. Today's the, the day of, of women's rights, isn't it? 
International Women's Rights Day. You know, we would never see any progress if people have not suffered. It's time to suffer for what you find is truthful for you, you know, and stand up for it. But also be known for that you can be true to the Bible and stand up for the poor and stand up for LGBT and stand up for for, for people who are suffering because of human trafficking, standing up for the Palestinians and other oppressed people. Why not get, become known as the people who actually are there to be trusted, where you can belong to, and therefore you know, here is a friend. Yes, it will be costly, but you will also win something else. And one of the things you will win is your integrity. That's good. Well, I'm, I'm just, I've got someone messaging me some of the questions from the, from the panel. So we'll hit some of those now. Uh, and do keep those questions coming. Um, so question for Arno, not sure who this is from. Uh, IHQ keeps repeating the message that we want to be inclusive, mm. but as we are an international movement, it is not safe, especially for some salvationists in Asia and Africa who face the death penalty mm. if we embrace full inclusion. How do we help the Salvation Army to understand that our own LGBTQ members are leaving the church, leaving faith and sadly often leaving life because we are not included. Mm. Uh, and this person has said, so you might know who this is in brackets. And I was privileged to join with Arno at the conference in the USA. <laughs> OK, good. Yeah, but see, the, the of course, it's all the denominations where it's a worldwide scope. Anglicans, Catholic, the Orthodox, the United Methodists all have an issue because that everybody has to kind of abide by the same theology and structure. And I don't know if one of the things is to start loosening up that grip on the whole movement and start to stop trying to control things. At the same time, I've done lots of ministry in India and Sri Lanka. You know, there's lots of LGBT people, but where shall they go? You don't need to have a rainbow flag outside to say you are inclusive, but what are we doing in these places? Would Salvation Army then stop having women in leadership in all the different countries where they don't really like women in leadership? It's, a, it's, it's been a value since the beginning that, that women are there and you take that fight. So it's also dangerous for us, you know, even in Denmark, you know, but just in a different way, when church is not inclusive. And just look at, at things like conversion therapy, trying to pray the gay away, and all the things we hear in sermons. So there is an issue, but I think we need to go back to, to IHQ again, and also be part of saying, now we actually want you to show up. We need also the inclusion officer to actually show up and have an open discussion, or with the general, or with others, and saying, you need now to engage with this openly, at least with the officers or within the, the, the denomination, and start to say, let's put it on the table and saying, here we have issues with danger, here we have issues with finance, here we've got some other issues. Let's just be honest about the discussion. But starting the ethical discussion a few years ago, and definitely as part of my experience from here, is that it almost died out before it even got started. It's just not helpful. But as our TC told us at that time, we'll start a dialogue, but don't expect any change. Why would I want to be part of something where no change is allowed? That is not dialogue. When I dial when we two meet at a cafe from time, I am part of changing because I listen to you and you listen to me. And that's part of that dynamic thing of actually listening to each other. So you cannot have a dialogue when we already made a decision that no change is going to happen. That is not a dialogue. Yeah. Uh, I think just to add to that, you know, uh, you know, as we move, and our big hope, of course, is as we move and the pace increases towards inclusion, uh, we need to start as we, you know, we, we need to start as we need to go. We need to we need to start being inclusive in that process. Uh, if we want to get to to the, the the promised land, I don't know if that's the right term, but if we want to get to that place, yeah. uh, it needs to be co-shaped. Um, I've got lots of questions here, Arno. So uh, some of them might be a little bit repetitive of things we've been talking about already, but um, someone's asking, how do we open this conversation with uh, the Salvation Army churches in places like, um, well, let's say Africa uh, yeah. and, and other places? It's not an issue. It's only an issue because we keep on thinking that people of color are evil because they do not, they're not as clever as us, they are not really understanding things and therefore 
Africa will automatically you know, be against us. Asia will automatically be against us. But actually, they are not. They, are, they have an issue because that's what we've taught them. Because again, we see a lot of Christians in the, in the States keep on pouring money into these countries to keep on telling them that you know, we are ch child abusers and everything else. Many of these cultures have traditions of, of, of same-sex relationships. Just look again at India that I know the best. You know, men relate in a very homoerotic way. You would, of, you would of course go hand in hand with another man down the street. You know, you would lie in each other's arms when you watch a film, you do that. So actually the whole way of relating is very different than it is in the West. So actually start, I have debated this with a lot of Asians and Africans. And when you start to say, let's hear the stories, let's talk about it. Let's look at also some of the issues in your society, you know, and therefore actually see that actually we are people of faith. You know, I think that 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 is, is not an issue starting that debate, but we just need to start to tell stories. So it also means that us that are LGBT are allowed to tell our stories. So if I was going to talk to people from Nigeria that are typically are strongly against LGBT, um, just look at the Anglican church, well, I would like to tell my story because it's when I, it's my story they have to then relate to. When then they hear that, hear that again, I, I do healing meetings, I do other things as well, and I do prophecy and all this, maybe I'm still a Christian. You know? And we need to see again that the caricature that's been, that, 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 that's been painted of us from the LGBT community is simply not true. So I think we just, it's not a matter of protecting them or something else, just get going, invite that debate and saying, let's sit down three or four people and do something, you know, and let's hear some stories. Let's hear some of the stories that are challenging in your country. Let's hear some of the challenging that's in here. But even just the thing about the injustice, is it okay for anybody in these countries to say that it's okay for Christian or for LGBT to be persecuted? Uh, the uh, um, so one church that I know of in London, they mainly can say, can, consist of refugees, Christian refugees from Uganda. Is it okay that people end up as refugees from Uganda because of the sexuality, Christian people being forced out of their country? Is that okay? If nothing else, let's start with the social justice issue of oppression and discrimination. Even before we get to it, are we okay about same-sex marriage and some of that? But can you... But in these countries, is it a price to encourage discrimination and oppression? Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. There's so much there. It's, uh, it's, it's great stuff. You know, when you were talking and, and uh, both now and in the content part, uh, and I think you had a slide where it said the dark night of the church when the empire is more kingdom than the church. Yeah. All your headlines were like bombshells to me. Um, but there was, I mean, there was something where you 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 were talking about structurally, uh, uh, as you know, within our organisations and institutions, they're not Christ-like, mm -hmm. they're, they're causing um, exclusion and all this. Yeah. What what was the role of uh, repentance in this conversation, and yeah. what does that look like on a organisational level? Because sometimes we kind of think we can skip that that we can you know strategize to a yep. better future, or we can run ahead before we kind of do that metanoia repentance moment what does that look like and what could it look like the first thing is salvation army cannot repent from what they've done before they change their minds because you cannot repent as long as you keep on oppressing people and discriminating against people i will not get healed from what the church is doing before the church starts to change its mind so you know we can i can keep on forgiving but 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 we do not get to reconciliation before the oppression stops. So that I do believe there is, there like the Oasis Church in, in London, they put adverts in the papers saying, sorry for what we've done as churches against LGBT. But at the moment, Salvation Army cannot ask, you know, ask forgiveness as long as it still discriminates because it's still part of hurting people. So we need to start a bit like the whole thing of, you know, to our own repentance, you know, and so God can heal the land, you know. So we need to start saying, well, actually, internally, is this acceptable? Are we going to repent, change our minds about these things so that we can ask for forgiveness and reconciliation to other people? 
I put an advert out recently of this on Facebook um, because I'm a body therapist and I wanted to especially do some trauma healing for LGBT community. Within 10 minutes, somebody has been in to look at my personal profile, see a work for Salvation Army, and they wrote, he's dangerous because he works for Salvation Army. So I had to quickly take this down about my clinic working to help people with trauma because working for Salvation Army would destroy my, my clinic before it even got started. So how do I also, you know, so for me as well, it is actually an issue for me to work as a civilian for Salvation Army because it stops me from reaching people I'd like to reach because Salvation Army is not just having a good word with everybody. Yes, some people will say Salvation Army, fantastic, wonderful brand, but there will also be groups that says, oh no, they're dangerous, they are hurting people. Mm -hmm. And that's my problem, the people I want to reach and see healing and wholeness, they know the Groups of Salvation Army is not kind to us. Well, we've got about five more minutes, Arno. Yeah. Uh, so if you can imagine an arc, if we can just edge towards, uh, you know, what, what, what signs of hope are you seeing? Yes. Uh, uh, what, what, what's your heart? What's your longing to see? Um, I'll ask you that in just a moment. So I'll give, I've already given you that one. But someone's uh, messaged, can you speak to us more about how to call our church communities to recognise love mm. and not only lust in the LGBT uh, BQ community? Mm -hmm. God is love. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows, mm -hmm. knows God. Can you speak to us more about the role of the church Mm -hmm. local church in in communities as a pastor yes yes the, the problem of course you have also of course i know your congregation uh, mark you know you can be welcoming but you cannot be inclusive or affirming because your structures do not allow that but at least you can be welcoming and you can try to do something there i think we need to do something in our preaching and that's also why I believe that one of the ways out of the dark night of the church is the whole thing of exploring what a more beautiful gospel looks like. You know, a gospel that again, look at the cross. You know, we don't, we, Jesus did not die on the cross because of an angry God. He died on the cross because of angry people. You know, God is love. Your uh, Chris also uh, did John 3.16, the whole thing that, that God sent Jesus into the world because of love. We are sent in to heal or be the healing voice to the community. And I think it's just as we've been used to often preach about taking care of people in the marchings and the poor and, and the homeless, we need to start just using other illustrations as well. Start to also dare to say, you know, and the trans person that I met the other day, you know, I did this with, you know, so we start to become visible. And that we don't just use testimonies in church of see this um, LGBT person, they are faced, they're really, really struggling, but they've chose to live in celibacy and see how kind of heroes they are because they live celibate lives. That is not a hero. That is often a person that are really much suffering and have deep, deep issues. So we need to find out which kind of stories are we celebrating? So I think in the local church, tell stories, show film clips, do things to do that. But also it's not just, promiscuity is not just for gay men. Just look at all the festivals, look at all the, the other things going on. You know, the straight community is, is just as good at this as we are. So maybe we need to stop painting caricatures, but actually start to show real people. So tell more stories, do something in the church, care for some people, invite dialogue, don't talk about people talk with people and you might not like everything they say but listen to it anyway and Arno, just before we we kind of um bring it to a close yes uh you've got a, a special role really i mean you you sit on the what is it the european uh, yeah, forum yeah forum for lgbt christian groups what signs of hope are you seeing or good practice on our in our I know this is a global uh, yeah, conversation yeah. today, but what signs of hope are you seeing on a, a European space? If I shall be really honest, I don't see a lot of hope right now. If I shall be really honest, I think that the right wing populism has taken over so much. Look at Eastern Europe. Um, we look at the uh, in the US as well. 
So I think the problem is that at the moment, the swing is not for inclusion, it's against inclusion. Um, what I do see of science of hope is, is groups like the United Methodists that at least are trying, daring, even saying if we need to split the denomination, which, which way can we do it in a healthy way? What can we do so we respect that there are different views here? Or can we find ways where we're saying, well, actually, it is up to each country or each congregation to do something so that we respect that it is different. In the Danish state church, it is not um, run by the bishop, really it's run by the government. But one of the things, they're forced to be inclusive. But for the evangelical pastors who are not, they can't refuse, for instance, to do a same-sex marriage. But they can say, I can't do it, but this person will do it for you instead. So you can pass the buck in a way, but as a denomination, they have still said inclusion is important. So I think we need to work with some of these models or like the Baptist where it's each congregation that makes a decision. But I think that we need to kind of loosen the structures and stop being so um, much like the old empire where it was Constantine that decided everything and all these kind of things, you know, and the church is taking over that control thing of society instead of allowing church to be a bit wilder, a bit more organic, and sometimes just really mess up, but at least we're trying to obey, to obey God and worship him. That's good. I quite like that bit at the end, for the church to be a bit more wilder. Arno, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you so much for sharing. And in the midst of that, we, we caught quite a bit of content. Uh, We've had our minds stretched and our, our thinking stretched, uh, but we've also experienced your heart and uh, your passion and your longing uh, for change and also your frustration. Um, and uh, I just want to uh, acknowledge that. Um, uh, thank you for that gift uh, of, of joining us tonight. Um, some announcements for, for, for you all are that, uh, if you haven't been, uh, we welcome you to visit the uh, uh, included page. There we go. That's good, isn't it? So there we go, www.includedpage.com. And on that page, you'll find some more resources, some videos uh, and some, uh, uh, yeah, just resources to help us further the conversation and, and to encourage you. We would also like to say to you that you can do that uh, and you can get some uh, conversations and, and up-to-date information on what we're doing on our social media stuff with Facebook. So we have a Facebook page as well. And we have an email, includedteam at gmail.com. And uh, we would love for you to reach out to us, whether you want to share your story, whether you have any further questions, whether you want to get involved in the movement. I don't know if we can call it a movement, but we long for it to be a movement. Uh, and we long for it to be a movement where no one is marginalized and everyone gets to play. Uh, so we welcome you to reach out to us and to talk to us for good ideas as well, suggestions on how we can uh, move this, this, uh, this conversation in a more dynamic and more impactful way. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and so so do reach out to us. We do really, really appreciate that engagement with you. Uh, we'd love to be in a physical room with you. We know our worlds are very much online at the moment. Um, and we're thanking God that we have these possibilities and we're thanking God that we can join like this. I think we're, what are we, 90? We were 92. Four people have already dropped off, uh, but we were 92 uh, at some point. So I, mean, I think that's just wonderful and that's that's great. Um, so before we go, I'm just going to pray and join me, uh, if you will. So this is actually a benediction uh, written by Vicky Beechin, who some of you might know, and it's for inclusive worship. Words create worlds. God spoke in Genesis his language distilling into stars, oceans, planets, and God still speaks today, always innovating and constantly creative. He does not bend to cultural progress, rather he leads the way, not innovation for innovation's sake, but the plan of an upside down kingdom where the last are first and the dinner table is set for the unlikeliest of guests. 
His magnificence draws in the outsider and swings wide the doors for any and for all. Religious elites look on, shaking their heads at the lavish outpouring of outrageous grace. Words create worlds. God spoke in Genesis, his language distilling into stars, oceans, planets, and God still speaks today. At his voice, echoes and new constellations dance into view. May we have minds that stretch wide enough to perceive the vastness of his imagination. And may we have ears to hear, unoffended by the greatness of his grace, even when its boundaries venture farther than our own. Amen. God bless you all. We'll see you soon.